Hello and welcome everybody to, uh, to uh, the KCOR talk, uh, Reimagining Nuclear Energy by Dr. Robert Walker. Um, and uh, it's my pleasure to, to introduce our speaker. He's an the, the, the tagline on his CV is an independent advisor and retired public service executive. That, that hardly describes it. Uh, uh, the last um, um, uh, few years of his, of his career was with uh, Atomic Energy of Canada Limited and, um, and uh, senior vice president of um, nuclear laboratory, uh, for, for the nuclear labs of uh, AECL. And then um, ultimately the president and CEO of that. Uh, and then when that's after I had actually lost sight of him, because before that, for about 33 years, he'd been um, a force to reckon with in uh, DND and and the research and development department. And uh, he was he was uh, spoken of always very kindly as Dr. Bob. And he was, if this means anything to you, CRAD chief of research and development. And that's when I lost sight of him. At any rate, uh, he, uh, he, he now speaks about uh, the future of nuclear energy and the future of, of uh, Canada's energy system. And um, I'll turn it over to you. With respect, Dr. Bob. <laughs> thanks, Zach, and thanks for that kind introduction. And, and hello, everybody. Look forward to uh, our conversations over the next 90 minutes. Let me begin this discussion with a few points. First off, let me declare I'm pro-nuclear and, and no doubt that'll come through in my presentation. However, I guess I call myself a clear-eyed uh, pr proponent for nuclear energy. Uh, three points. First is that I think we'd all agree that global energy systems have begun the transition towards a low-carbon future. The debate is, is how to do so, how fast, and how to fund it. Secondly, there's a, a broad international consensus among policymakers and, and uh, the public that uh, a massive build out of variable renewables, wind, solar, will be a key player, if not the backbone in this transition. And the third point I'd make is that unlike the consensus around variable renewables, there is not a consensus among policymakers and the public on the role that nuclear energy could play in that transition. Uh, and that's what I want to talk about today, is what that future could be. And as the title of this talk suggests, the premise that this takes uh, some substantial rethinking of what nuclear energy is and what that role could be. And that's what I want to explore with you over the next 40 minutes or so. I'm gonna start in a place that probably will surprise you because I'm gonna start with um, uh, a core question. I'm just gonna turn that pointer off to be able to advance here. A core question of what is the relationship we see today uh, at the interface of science, society, and policy. There's multiple perspectives of this, but certainly social scientists would tell us that the relationship among scientists, society, and policy has changed profoundly over the 60 years or so from when nuclear energy first came on the scene in the 1950s. There is the uh, relationship between policymakers and scientific evidence and the advice of scientific experts. There's a relationship between society and that same uh, uh, nexus of science advice and and scientific experts. And, and finally, there's also the view that society has of politicians and their policies that purport to be informed by, by science. So, so let me make this real for you in a very explicit way that's relevant to us all today. Here it is. Does that not seem relevant to the discussions today? The science says to wear a mask. Seems simple enough. But reality is that if we unwind the nuances of the discussion from what the science is saying, of course, this has really been science in action over the pandemic and, and developing the science in real time, to the way the, the uh, policymakers are taking that advice and translating it into the policy in the way we expect 
individuals to behave. Uh, this is tough, it's complex. I was struck by a headline that appeared in the Ottawa Citizen newspaper uh, this Monday morning, which uh, observes that the COVID-19 rebellion is a complex issue. This is not simple. If it was just about the facts, and acceptance of those facts, then frankly, nuclear energy would have a, 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 a clear and, and viable future. But it's much more, much more complicated than that. Uh, social scientists contribute this to a variety of factors. Uh, the next slide here gives a, a sum of those. I don't in, report to this to be a, a, a rigorous examination of the social science literature. But the relationship between science and the public's acceptance, for example, just the language of science here gets often lost in translation that the, the notion of the public's acceptance of risk and certainly the whole issue of vaccines, vaccine anti-vaxxers, vaccine hesitancy, the interface between uh, is the vaccine effective enough and is it safe enough is both what a regulator says and what the public and individuals interpret that to be saying this notion of activism where uh, proponents actually opponents to a particular objective and nuclear energy would be a key key example here uh, can have very very differing views from the proponents as to what uh, is the reality uh, there is this whole concept that social scientists call motivated reasoning where uh, oftentimes we look at scientific evidence through the language of our tribes who do we connect with this seems to be a very, very strong phenomenon in the U.S. these days with the, if you brand an individual as um, a Democrat or Republican, you can probably predict with a high degree of confidence whether there's a belief that, sign, that um, uh, climate change is caused by human activity. There is this concept of social license that even though a regulator operating on the, on the basis of science says something is approved, communities may actually be opposed for, for a somewhat simple, a different interpretations of the evidence. And that is actually undermining the ability of the regulator to move forward and the proponent to implement. There is the relationship between science and media and more specifically in the last decade with social media where no matter what issue that you find there, uh, you can always find an expert that will come up and, and provide an opposing view the question of who is who is more credible and finally this dilemma where oftentimes we find that scientific evidence is leading to conflicting public good conflicts the example of the pandemic is a classic one where the experts say we need to keep people safe the consequences that governments shut down our workplaces our schools and our borders and so on all to say that this is complex so that's the background to the next part of my discussion, which is to look a bit at where we find nuclear energy today. At times, I'll refer to nuclear power versus nuclear energy, but just to be clear, uh, the former refers to the generation of electricity or power through uh, nuclear energy, whereas nuclear energy, of course, generates heat, which can have applications beyond electricity markets, though fundamentally, uh, to date, that is what it has been about. So let's look at some uh, perspectives on the reality today. Here's what I would call the, the green side of the scorecard. We have a number of reactors around the world in several countries. It's about 10% of the global electricity generation. That installed capacity is big, it's 400. The G stands for a uh, billion, so that's uh, gigawatts, so that's 400 billion watts and the small d of electricity. That's typically uh, thermal plants that operate on about 30% efficiency. So multiply that by three to actually know the thermal energy generated. Canada is a big player. It's a tier one nuclear nation. The, its reactor base is in Ontario and one in New Brunswick. It's a big part of the energies, uh, uh, the, uh, the fact that Canada has one of the cleanest electricity systems in the country, that with hydro, and a big player in Ontario. Uh, reactors are continuing to be built. Uh, primarily, it's about the build out these days in Asia, with uh, China, India, and Russia leading the way. And those new builds are more or less on budget and on schedule. 
Uh, it turns out that the refurbishment of reactor fleets is occurring around the world and the poster child of those rebuilds is actually here in Ontario, which is uh, currently looking as in the process of refurbishing 10 of its CANDU reactors at the Bruce and uh, Darlington sites. That is uh, the largest clean energy project in North America at 25 billion. I'm pleased to say the first of the 10 reactors has completed its refurbishment on schedule and on budget uh, and will deliver ultimately um, 30 more years of lifetime to those reactors at a price point that's about eight cents a kilowatt hour electric. And that is extremely competitive with, um, with all energy sources possible. And finally, if, if one is prepared to get into the data uh, nu nuclear energy is among the lowest in terms of uh, greenhouse gas emissions, affordability, scalability, and even safety, including accidents. Uh, but we'll talk more about that later. That's one side of the ledger, but there's another side of the ledger as well. A number of nations have decided who have been uh, nuclear nations are, have decided to exit uh, from nuclear. I've indicated for the prominent ones, there may be others. I, I'm not quite sure if that's the case. We've actually seen the case, the, the largest number of plants in one country or in the US, which has about 100 operating reactors and has had uh, four, five, six of these shut down in recent years, not because they're unsafe or at the end of their operational life, it's that they can't compete with natural gas in the unregulated market space. We've also seen a number of new builds in Europe and US that are uh, way over budget and way behind schedule, principally because the reactor technologies that are being rolled out, and I'll talk about this in a moment, are what's called third generation technology. So they're first of kind and historically nuclear is pro always has problems when it's rolling out first of kind uh, designs. And we still have the legacy of Three Mile Island, Chernobyl and Fukushima those accidents that sh shape public perceptions. And when polling occurs, no matter if it's here in Canada or around the world, there continues to be persistent high levels of what I called nuclear energy hesitancy. So, so what's contributing to all of this? Well, let's explore this. It really does posit the future as having two rather, ra rather stark uh, bounding scenarios. On the one, we'll see that current fleet of the boat 400 reactors over the next 30 years or so as, it, as they reach the end of their operational lives be shut down and not any longer play a significant role in a, a low carbon future. A sen second scenario actually would see the uh, global nuclear fleet grow and uh, you will see the bias here. This is a World Nuclear Association objective to grow uh, by adding a thousand billion watts electric of new reactor nuclear over the next uh, the next 30 years that would get the capacity of electricity through uh, nuclear to about 25 percent from its current position of about 10 percent that may seem like a tall order but we'll come back and talk about what uh, uh, other experts say about what needs to be done in the nuclear space so if we come to what the future may look like, I would suggest that there are two broad challenges that the industry has uh, and in the future. The first here is that it is very expensive to build a new nuclear power plant. That is a fact. Uh, if you look at how much it costs, the, uh, I'll, but let me come back to that in a moment. The point here is that nuclear power economics are not just about the cost of actually building the plant on the other hand, they are extremely inexpensive to operate and they have very long plant lifetimes, up to 80 years. The combination of low operating costs and, and long lifetimes mean that very high uh, construction costs can be amortized over a long period of time. And so they have a competitive, competitive uh, cost of electricity, what's called the levelized cost of electricity the cost of per kilowatt per uh, the cost per uh, the cost per kilowatt hour uh, kilowatt produced uh, typically the target is to be around five cents a kilowatt uh, uh, produced and that would make one competitive with what natural gas can do uh, in terms of the cost metrics of course the construction cost is the absolute number 
discount count rate is essentially the interest on the mortgage to finance the plant. And finally, the, the concept of overnight capital cost is essentially the construction cost per unit energy produced. And if we come back to say what drives that high cost, on this circle, I've tried to give you a, set, a sense of the key factors. I'm going to start, however, by looking at the consequence that the cost is so large, and to put it in perspective, it's a, it typically runs, these plants are typically a, a billion watts electric a unit, very large, and the cost runs anywhere from five billion to $10 billion to, put a, uh, to build a gigawatt electric plant. Uh, and oftentimes we're seeing these plants with multiple uh, reactor units at the same site. So we're talking enormous financing. The consequence of that is that that kind of risk is beyond equity markets. And so inevitably there needs to be some kind of state backing in the financing of these deals. Uh, of course, if you're talking about financing the build in your own country, that's one thing for the state to be talking about. If you're talking about financing the build in somebody else's economy, that's something else. And frankly, if we look at where new builds are, who is actually uh, leading the new builds globally, the key players increasingly these days are Russia and China. And why is that? It's because when they come to the countries, they also come with financing backed by the Russian and uh, Chinese governments, which is problematic in Western democracies. If you come to back, what are actually driving those costs? It's an intersection of, faith, of factors. First in the upper left, it's about the technology. Over these 60 years, it, we have gravitated to having about 80% of those 440 reactors as all in the, in, the, in the technology of pressurized water reactors that use moderation of the neutrons to uh, go to relatively low levels of enrichment of uranium fuels. Uh, we are now seeing uh, the entry into the markets of what are called the third generation of these reactors and the the primary difference from the previous two generations is these reactors are now uh, what are referred to as passively safe. So with the loss, entire loss of, of off-site and on-site electrical power, the reactor will actually go to zero thermal energy on its own. That said, at the same time, we have the principle of as the, the market being focused on national electric gr grids with reliable base load on the principle of economies of scale. So actually, if you, even though the price of building the unit is very, very large, the concept of building, the larger you build it, the cost or the overnight capital cost, the cost per unit of electricity actually produced actually is reduced. A key idea, however, is that for economies of scale to work, you need to be building enough of these plants so you get beyond the inevitable first of kind hurdles, you have the benefit of production learning from doing it repeatedly, and you get your supply chain performing at top notch as each reactor builds. Uh, as one example, in the build out of the Candu fleets internationally, AECL's last seven builds of Candu reactors were all built on budget and on schedule not so with early uh, uh, builds and certainly the build out of the Darlington plant in Ontario was a case in point which was very over budget and, be and behind schedule. How long does it take to build one of these uh, large reactors? Depends where you are. We're finding the experience right now in Asia and, and Russia and India where they're actually into fleet production. The schedules are running five to seven years and the price tag per, kilo, per, per, right, per gigawatt is around the five billion, three to five billion numbers. However, you get into Europe and North America where we're seeing smaller numbers of, of Gen 3 reactors coming out for the first time, that schedule is getting up closer to a decade. And the price, as I said, is getting up to the five to $10 billion. That said, the numbers at the end of the day with levelized costs are still in, this, in the realm of competitive with other electricity sources. 
But in my view, this is a problem that needs to be addressed. The second issue I want to talk a bit about is public perception of the technology. And uh, this is a very polarized technology. I think we'd all agree with that. Over the 60 years, we've seen the, the growth of a very activist uh, um, anti-nuclear movement. Uh, this, is, these, this is in democracies. These are people's rights to, uh, to come out and, 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 and have opposing views. But the difference between uh, these two views, which both claim to be based on science and evidence is quite stark uh, from, if you just look down the notion of, is it safe? Uh, how does it deal with, uh, with proliferation? Is it, is it economic? Uh, is it clean or dirty? Can it solve the waste problem? What about accidents? What about its radiation? And oh, by the way, we don't need it because we have renewables. Uh, this really does put in the minds of the public some pretty profound questions. Is it worth the risk? Do the benefits outweigh the risks? And finally, this whole notion of uh, are there preferable alternatives? And, and I would say playing into this, there's a variety of, of, of realities, some of which relate to my earlier com comments about the perception of science in the public. Uh, but it's also related to the whole life cycle of decision making that goes around a nuclear power plant, which I've tried schematically to indicate here from a decision to, to build, to, uh, to then operate and possibly refurbish, then operate and possibly decommission and ultimately dispose of the waste. And through that very long time frame, which you see here can be as long as 80 years, which is the can-do fleets in, uh, in, in Canada are on the, the path to be somewhere between 70 and 80 years and maybe refurbishable again. Um, but within that cycle, we see the world changes. We see different uh, norms and public expectations. The marketplace changes. We see advances in science and technology and we see other global disruptions that come along. And through that, then we see the decision characteristics are they're episodic with gaps in time. We can see grant dramatic changes in the context. Uh, we can see that the decision making tends to focus on risks and the, as opposed to what are the benefits and that decision making adds to cost because it's slow, it's complex, expensive and uncertain. This next chart is a blow below here and it's gonna seem like a bit of an eye test but that's actually on purpose. And because what I try to indicate to you is the decision making that goes as required by regulation of this very highly regulated industry. So these are the decisions that go into the life cycle of a nuclear power plant, EA's environmental assessment, to license to site, to license to build, to license to operate, which needs to be renewed every five to 10 years. So to operate, to operate, to operate, then to refurbish, then to operate, to operate, to operate, to decommission and ultimately dispose of the waste. And every one of those um, decision points, there are two critical issues. The first is the proponent for the, uh, the, 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 the plant action uh, needs to say, yes, I have a business case here that works economically. If so, then I need the regulator to make the call that what I'm proposing to do is safe. And playing back to this concept of proponent opponents, each of these regulatory decisions is an opportunity, and this is actually what occurs, for the proponent to come forward and say, yes, it is safe, and for the opponents to come back and say, no, it is not. And uh, uh, ultimately, the regulator makes a decision not based on what uh, an opponent or proponent is saying, but rather based on the submission made by the proponent and its own assessment of the science behind, is it safe? But in the public's eye, what we see is this repeated focus on the risk. Is it safe? Yes, it is. No, it's not. And I believe that does play into the whole perception uh, that goes forward around the, uh, uh, the case for nuclear power. What's the way out of this? It's not obvious to me that there is a simple solution to it, but I do suggest that, that one place to, to start is by rethinking the risk benefit calculus. And I would suggest it's not about just nuclear energy, but it's all about 
all of the energy sources that we have that can contribute to the energy transition moving forward. What I've highlighted here, of course, is what tends to be the big three foci of the engagement with regulators that occur at those decision points, the focus of anti-nuclear opposition, and the way the public tends to perceive the debate often reflected through the media. The first is the issue of ionizing radiation. The second is the issue of safety. And the issue, the third is the issue of nuclear waste. The points I've made here, I will admit, are biased. These tend to be the view brought forward by the proponent view around ionizing radiation. The reality is that it is naturally occurring. And what nuclear power plants produce is actually a very, very small fraction to what is out there uh, in our own backyard already uh, through uh, you know, cosmic radiation and radiation coming from natural sources uh, in, in, in the uh, natural decay in, in the uh, geosphere. Uh, finally, the question of safety. This is an issue that uh, repeatedly I find um, when I talk to friends and colleagues that just say what? That if one actually goes back and looks at the UN studies of the uh, deaths attributable to the three major uh, nuclear accidents that have occurred, how many people have died as a result of ionizing radiation, either through radiation poisoning or onset of, of cancer. The number is in a few hundred, a couple hundred, few hundred. And so the analysis suggests that taking into account all the, life, the possible risk to human life through the life cycle of, of uh, uh, energy generation, generating technologies, <laughs> nuclear power actually comes out as the safest. Now, I realize that I make a point like that, it's going to end up with a very rich discussion because there'll be scientists come forward and say, and there's alternative evidence that suggests that there's some other answer. And that plays back to some of my earlier comments around uh, the science debate and when the science debate uh, occurs in the, in the public eye. And finally, the issue of waste. Um, the, the, the whole premise of the nuclear industry is that it produces very low volumes of nuclear waste compared to other waste forms and that those low volumes are, are manageable. Uh, it is also the only technology out there that is fully internalized the cost of its waste and decommissioning. The cost of, of managing the nuclear waste and decommissioning the plants has to be embedded uh, by law in the uh, cost of the electricity to borne by the market, by the, the, the rate payer, that is the case today. Uh, and the broad view that by moving uh, uh, spent fuel into the geosphere, 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 pardon me, provides effective barriers. All, point for, all points for debate, but these are all about risks. None of these points are about the benefit. And I, I'd suggest that there, there's an opportunity by adding to this a number of other perspectives that play into the risk benefit calculus, whether it's about water use, where nuclear is actually in the middle of the pack with other technologies, employment, a general view that uh, more jobs with nuclear energy, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, the, the tour de force issue today is that uh, throughout the life cycle, the evidence suggests that uh, nuclear is not quite as good as wind, but better than hydro and solar. Land use, it's way ahead other, of other um, uh, low greenhouse gas technologies. Human health, estimates that nuclear power over its 60 odd years of, of uh, operation by displacing the use of fossil fuels as the alternative in that time space to have generated electricity has actually saved millions of lives and billions to national healthcare systems uh, through the avoidance of air pollution, uh, which the uh, World Health Organization estimates kills about 7 million people annually worldwide. And a large part of that is through fossil fuels used for electricity production. Uh, resource efficiency, the needs for structural materials to actually build plants. And this issue around uh, a key one is affordability, that when one puts forward the cost of generation, that so-called low, uh, levelized cost of electricity, one does not account for in that the cost for added uh, distribution, backup storage that occurs when, for example, we add variability into the generation mix that would occur with wind and solar. 
And as those, uh, the proportion of those technologies come into the system, cost goes up unless you have uh, assist dispatchable technologies that can come up and make up the distant difference efficiently, which is that something that in fact nuclear can do uh, well. And finally, this ocean, that notion that uh, at, the, at the heart nuclear energy is about heat, and that combination of heat and electricity are actually enormously beneficial uh, outside of the electricity sector. All to say that there's perhaps other ways of looking at the risk-benefit calculus. So, what about the climate emergency? And what about its role in nuclear energy? I, I, I suggest that the Paris Accord of 2015 was the seminal moment in the journey to build the, 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 the global commitments to, to action, to really get serious about transitioning to a low carbon future. And, and certainly with Paris, there was a very visible uh, commitment to have variable renewables lead the way in that transition with virtually at that time, no mention of, or very little mention of the role of nuclear energy. In the ensuing five years, we've seen nuclear energy come back into the dialogue. I've indicated a few of the key initiatives, the, you know, the launch of the, around the clean energy ministerial, which is coming out of Paris. A number of nations agreed to come together in this forum to actually promote innovation uh, in clean energy technologies. And in 2018, it launched the, you know, the Nuclear Innovation for a Clean Energy uh, or NICE Future Initiative, which was to uh, promote uh, the introduction of nuclear in conjunction with renewables as part of that journey. We've had the very, very influential intergovernmental panel on climate change state in its 2018 report that all of its scenarios for a sustainable future require more nuclear energy, nuclear power. And finally, the uh, uh, OECD's International Energy Agency, generally considered as one of the, the most authoritative on, uh, on energy transitions in its 2019 report, again made the observation that if we take nuclear out of the mix, uh, we're in a very hard place if we're not already there with the journey with nuclear. And what I want to do is spend just a few minutes and drill down a bit on what that, uh, uh, what the IEA is saying, because I think it really does get to the heart of a number of the challenges here. So I'm going to, in the next slide, uh, say that what the IEA has said about uh, the future of nuclear energy is, is, is six big points. And, and, and it's, it has focused on the power perspective. In other words, electricity, but I suggest that that's a somewhat limiting view of the potential for uh, nuclear energy, more of that in a moment. Th this first here is that it can play a, a big role in the, en in the um, in clean energy transitions and do so in, in multiple ways. Uh, the, the, this, the second bullet here is that uh, we need essentially an all hands on deck uh, approach here and nuclear power has some special reasons why it should be in the mix. The first thing is it said you have to take that existing fleet, those 440 reactors, and keep them on the grid as long as we can because it's essential to uh, what it uses the language, getting us back on track on the energy uh, transitions. It's not the time to be taking nuclear out of the mix. The, sec the third here is that if we do take it out of the mix, then it's the, the challenge of getting to a sustainable, sustainable energy future is all that much harder. This last point, if you take nuclear energy out, electricity systems become inherently less flexible. Uh, this notion that, as perhaps I've intimated with my discussions around the cost of, of building nuclear plants, is the, the, um, the hurdles in, um, in, in funding these projects are daunting. Uh, uh, but if we, if we don't do it, we're in a, a harder place. So we really do have to look at the, the barriers to new construction. And as I've indicated, the mobilizing investment piece is, is certainly one of those core elements. Uh, this very, very simple but enormously powerful statement that you, if you try to replace nuclear power with more renewables, it will cost more. 
And the final point here is some views on the policy levers that uh, policymakers need to consider to make sure that nuclear power is in uh, a level playing field with other technologies to be able to move forward. Uh, and uh, that includes, um, I would highlight uh, investments in, as, as we are advocating innovation in all clean energy technologies, we also need to move forward innovation in the nuclear space. And I'll be coming back to that in a moment. Let me show you a few graphics just to try to make this real. Here's a, a chart I, I took out from um, uh, an IEA publication uh, this year. And, and it's looked at uh, uh, where it posits uh, we could be um, in, it's gone out 2070 and in its 2020 20 energy outlook, it actually has created an even more ambitious scenario that has us to what it's referred to as net zero carbon emissions by 2050 versus 2070. The column on the left is where we are today. The units here are millions of tons of oil equivalency. So essentially a unit for energy and perhaps the numbers that was important is only the relative numbers here because uh, it's a way of comparing all of the technologies possible. And, and this is for energy, not just for electricity. Uh, the one on the right says, if we just take the policies that governments have stated today, where will we get to? And you'll notice we, uh, at the end of 2070, we're at about the same emissions level as we are today. Clearly that's not going to work. It's developed a scenario which is called it's the sustainable development scenario, which sees the energy levels globally in, in MTOEs at about the same level as they are today, which suggests that we've had uh, qu quite ambitious approaches to conservation, for example. But in that mix, you'll notice uh, that renewables really scale up uh, from around 2,000 uh, uh, million tons to about uh, 10,000 million, uh, 10, a million tons. And we also see is forecasting about a doubling of the nuclear power capacity. Interestingly, about the same number as that scenario from the World Nuclear Association I talked about earlier. So the back, so clearly, Renewables, including variable renewables, are a big part of this, including model, modern bioenergy, uh, but we also need more nuclear power. Let me give this a same graphic, uh, same table, but in graphical form. Uh, this steps, this is the state of policy scenario, and then this is the sustainable development scenario. These, the, the scales all normalize to 100%. Uh, but these dots indicate what percentage of the uh, energy source is from fossil fuels, numbers dropping dramatically, not to zero, but dramatically. And the pink shows the proportionality of uh, nuclear energy's role. We also see how solar is really seen to be the big winner in the build out and, and given the dramatic costs we're seeing in solar panel technology that's heartening we may be able to get there. I, I also have one final chart which is looking beyond the electricity, uh, beyond the, um, the end use of electricity into industry, transport and buildings as other very key energy consumers. And this chart is trying to show you, again, it's uh, in millions tons of oil equivalent, what the shifts would be away from, on the left, the negatives, away from coal, from oil, from uh, gas, and into electrification, and into hydrogen, and into bioenergy as among the key elements here. But I want to highlight in particular that electricity and hydrogen play to enormous opportunities for uh, nuclear energy going forward. So what's the bottom line here is that a path to, according to the, nine, to the IEA for nuclear energy is we got to make sure we keep the option open, get those lifetimes extended. We should be valuing this concept of dispatchability, the ability of nuclear power to provide the lobe following when the wind isn't blowing and the sun isn't shining to make up the shortfall. Uh, this notion of a level playing field for nuclear power, some of those 
elements I talked about in the earlier chart about the um, about the risk benefit calculus. Uh, on the safety re regulations, revisit the regulations. There's a view that many of these nuclear plants could be reconfigured to be more load, load following to help uh, with the a case for build out of renewables or uh, variable renewables, the financing framework, uh, get the new construction going, and then at the same time be looking at innovations that uh, solve some of the problems in that nuclear energy is facing today and keep your people well engaged. So, and I'm gonna focus in the rest of the talk about this piece here, but in principle, what's it saying? Uh, the priorities being, well, first is convent, extend the life of the current fleet. Third, second is to get those new builds out there with Gen 3 technologies, but, but importantly, begin a transition rapidly to new nuclear energy. Ones that get those construction costs down. One that get to simpler and safer designs. Ones that enable scale up of variable renewable energy one that looks beyond electricity markets and one that reduces nuclear waste streams. And what's the answer to that? Well, that's about reimagining nuclear energy. And the heart of it is about innovation. And it's this nexus between the look at what are called fourth generation reactor technologies and in smaller packages. Modularize through the construction in factories and modular addition to existing plant structure as more demand dictates more energy. In the boxes, I've indicated all of the dimensions that uh, this intersection of fourth generation and small, rad, uh, small modular concepts lets one address from com competition in the market to reduce capital costs to co-generation, to compatibility with new renewables, to an enabler of the hydrogen economy. And personally, as a scientist, I find it almost uh, literally eye-watering what these technologies could potentially offer. Is it real? Well, it turns out, I, I, I think this number is up to date, but there are many companies around the world that are in development of these technologies that are targeted to be market readiness over the course of the next decade. I've just indicated to you a couple of examples here of ones that are uh, being pursued here in Canada. I'd also highlight that um, we have uh, fusion coming and importantly fusion in small modular reactor footprints. I, I don't think it's going to be ready in the next uh, 10 to 20 years, but maybe uh, we'll see it in the 20 to 30 to 40 year time frame. The point about these reactor characteristics is that what they do fundamentally differently is they actually address a number of the inherent hazards in existing uh, um, pressurized water reactors that need to be managed through uh, defense in depth systems in those reactors. And so you end up with simpler designs, which are easier to regulate, which are uh, less expensive to build. Uh, uh, generally, we move away from the concept of moderation that allows the burning up of more of the what are called the transuranics or the actinides in the periodic table above uranium that can occasionally get captured when a neutron is captured in the in the nu nucleus and creates another uh, atom uh, and using those as fuel. These get away from needing pressure. They don't use water in the primary cycle. By consequence, you don't have parasitic hydrogen you end up capturing the fission products in ways that uh, re, uh, reduce the possibility of release of volatile fission products. You end up with, I'll come back and speak about this in a moment, impressive ways of storing heat and with this whole concept of walk away safety. In this example here, this is a molten salt reactor design that's being promoted by a, a Canadian company called Terrestrial Energy and indicative of these classes of reactors, if you look at what its, its market is looking at serving, there are three. And you'll notice the first is called power generation. So that's the classical concept. If you've got heat, you, you turn it into, um, you turn turbines with the heat and you generate electricity. However, you can also take that uh, heat, which in this case is in the form of molten salt, and you can actually store that heat in the molten salt 
and then turn around and dispatch that heat into electricity when you need it. And so this is, an ex is actually the technology that's employed in concentrated solar plants that use uh, the sunlight to essentially create heat. And that technology has now been quite well developed as storing, uh, storing thermal energy in molten salts. And, and so in concept, if you're building one nuclear plant for about every three or four solar or wind farms, you've actually solved the energy storage problem for those variable renewables by dispatching the heat in the molten salts from that reactor when the other technologies aren't able to deliver the energy. And you're not requiring an separate, a separate energy storage technology with its footprint and added costs. And finally, this whole notion of delivering that uh, heat directly as process heat into uh, into the heavy industry or, or frank, frankly into concepts such as desalination of water. Enormously powerful ideas. So in order to do that though, it's about more than the technology. It's certainly with the ideas that I've talked about earlier of smaller Gen 4 technologies and the modular construction, a whole bunch of those problems I've talked about historically with nuclear power get addressed. But that's not all. There are uh, four other paradigm shifts that need to be embraced to make this work. First is the whole concept of markets. These small modular reactors are about more than on-grid power. Yes, they are very much in that space. A typical uh, gas or coal plant is around 150 to 300 megawatt electric. So you provide a one-to-one -one platform for change out. You get the opportunity by adding more mo modules for electrification growth. And as I've indicated earlier, matching up nuclear with solar and wind actually solves the energy storage problem. You end up with a solution for resource extraction and for heavy industry, which typically sees energy requirements in this range of 10 to 50 megawatt electric as well as wanting the thermal energy. Importantly, this is a very powerful way of moving us to the hydrogen economy. And finally, we have remote communities which need electricity, disparate heating, desalination, food production. These typically are in the one to 10 megawatt electric range. And certainly in Canada, our northern communities, many of which are in an energy poverty situation could benefit from this technology. The second is the concept of fleets. Right now, as I've indicated, the principle of uh, affordability of nuclear power plants is on the concept of economies of scale. The bigger you build it, the lower the unit cost of electricity per uh, uh, unit of electricity delivered. In the SMR concept, it's the economies of multiples. Repeated building of the technology gets the production learning uh, more effective and dramatically reduces the unit costs, something we all know if we own an iPhone to what the price of that was a decade ago versus what it is now relative to the technology. It very much depends on standardization and importantly also around harmonization of regulatory processes across countries. That said, it's also important to recognize the profound difference that comes with the concept of SMR fleets relative to what we see today. We're into today's paradigm, we have a, a few of these very large reactors at a few sites for a few communities with a few customers. But in the SMR enabled paradigm, it's actually many reactors, many sites, many customers, many host communities. I talked earlier that we have about 440 reactors globally with about 400 megawatt or gigawatt electric well, if you, if you go from a gigawatt per unit plant to 100 megawatt per unit plant, that's a factor of 10 increase in the number of reactors we have. So it's no longer 400 reactors, it's 4,000 reactors. And if we go to 10 megawatt electric per unit, it's 10,000 reactors. So the numbers really do require rethinking of the paradigm. Uh, it's also about the business model. 
Currently, it's fair to say that nuclear power is led at the state level. It relates to that financing dilemma enabled by the private sector. With SMRs, these are within the realm of the equity markets, so it becomes private sector led, and the role of the state is with policies to enable. It's also about new business relationships because the concept of host community is no longer just about oh, there's a plant that's delivering energy to somebody else. It's my plant, it's delivering energy to me. And with that, certainly in discussions with indigenous communities in Canada, uh, a number of these uh, 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 nations see the opportunity for a business relationship, including uh, potentially holding equity in the plant. However, it's also about rethinking the relationship between the plant owner, the operator, and the licensee, in current regulatory environments, those tend to be one and the same entity. It's about the utility that wants the um, capability. It owns the reactor, it operates the reactor, and it licenses the reactor. If you look at a number of these uh, markets beyond on-grid electricity, that relationship gets spread across multiple players. And finally, it's about looking beyond ourselves to other insights from other industries. I've said the global airline industry is perhaps one to look at, perhaps not as it's coming out of COVID, but what it was going in, where we actually have uh, techno uh, fleets of, react of um, aircraft being built uh, across a global industry, service through global supply chains, and then operated by um, airlines and serviced by airlines in a global concept. It's, it's something more akin to what uh, SMRs could look like in the future. And finally, and perhaps the most critical, is rethinking engagement. Uh, it is clear that the current, uh, uh, the current processes that we have out there are largely focused on engagement around uh, understanding and, I'm um, sorry, what we need to do is get a better understand of just what are societal expectations uh, and respond credibly to these. Uh, to look at the relationship with Indigenous and, and communities impacted uh, through the value proposition by engaging early and developing that proposition with them, not bringing it to them, and finally changing that perception of risk relative to benefit. And to wrap this up with just a couple of slides, Canada is in a unique opportunity to, uh, to contribute. Uh, I said it this earlier, but to make it real, Canada is a tier one nuclear nation. It uh, has among the richest uh, supplies of uranium uh, globally. Uh, it's actually, uranium mining is the largest employer of indigenous peoples in Canada. Uh, the, uh, the exports of uranium relative to the energy content in that uranium are about the same level as the energy content of oil and gas coming out of Canada. Uh, we also have our operating plants in Ontario at Bruce, at Darlington, at Pickering, and the one site at uh, Point Le Pro. We have Canada's largest science and technology complex at Chalk River Canadian Nuclear Laboratories. We have our own Canadian, one of a very small number of nations worldwide that have developed a, a, an indigenous a, a Canadian, a indigenous reactor or can do technology. And we have a, a very well respected uh, regulator. Um, so what is it that Canada can do here? We've had recently in 2018 the release of a, a roadmap, uh, an effort of the federal government, a number of provincial governments, territorial governments on what this could look like. Why in Canada? Three big reasons. The first is that we have the technological basis and the regulatory environment to do so. Second is that Canada actually has a number of the indicative markets, markets for on-grid, markets for resource development, heavy industry, and markets for off-grid northern communities. And finally, we've had an innovation come in with our regulator, the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission, which has, um, for a fee, invited, been, uh, invited vendors to submit proposals for their technology and the uh, regulator will assess whether that technology can be licensed and where there may be gaps in data that need to be generated to make it licensable. So things are happening. Engagement is happening. Big focus on relationships with indigenous communities. 
Uh, partnerships are in place. Uh, we've seen a strong partnership among the uh, governments of New Brunswick, Ontario, uh, Saskatchewan, and now Alberta to look at uh, bringing SMRs into their fleets over the course of the next decade or so. And demonstrations are moving forward. Some key milestones, we're expecting to see the first small uh, modular reactor in Canada demonstrated in the early 2020s at Canadian Nuclear Laboratories. There's more in the planning. Uh, um, Ontario Power Generation that owns the Darlington site has recently announced its intent to have a, an SMR sited at Darlington by 2028. And this idea in these other provinces has seen rollout of this technology in the early 2030s. So folks, just to play a bit with words here, we've all know the not in my backyard acronym. I'm just playing with this a bit, but it seems to me the acronym we aspire for is nuclear is actually in my backyard and that's okay. <laughs> Zach, I think that's it. And I'll uh, just take this off screen here. Back to you. Okay, th thanks. Thanks very much, Bob. That's wonderful. Um, I've got a, a few questions here. First one is gonna be from Art. And then I've got a few from, uh, from Ted Manning and a whole um, shotgun load of questions from Dave Doherty, or unless that's Gene. Um, I, I, I see Art laughing. Art, you're up first. Okay, I was uh, delighted to see that you did a, a address fusion and um, you, you put it off into some time into the distant future. Clearly fusion has has two sizes, the very large facility that's being, uh, the Takamak being built in France. And, and that keeps running into some um, major hurdles as well. But those, those uh, Takamak reactors have been around, uh, I think I first ran into one in the 1980s. And I'm sure they were before that as well. Some of the early stuff out of Princeton. Um, okay, would you close that door? And the, uh, uh, of course, what has happened in the meantime is the world of uh, low energy nuclear reactors. And <clears throat> this phenomena has been uh, under study and development in, in many countries uh, around the world. Um, <clears throat> uh, I do know of only one place in Canada where they are. Um, Doing experiments on LNER and and uh, have have had uh, quite a bit of success. That's Lakehead University. Um, what is your opinion of um, of fusion and its future? I know you think it's it's some time off in the future, but were were your comments directed at at the very large of the or of the um, uh, the SMR size? Thanks, thanks, Art. That's a very, very appropriate question. So my comment was 20 years. Now, now let me be clear here, is that that's before we see operating uh, fusion plants. And, and, and I would say, so, so as a young graduate student many, many years ago at McMaster, my graduate work was actually related to fusion energy. And so, uh, and it was around the practicalities of radiation effects in, in the first wall of fusion reactors. There are many, many uh, challenges beyond the question of can I sustain a plasma. What the positive thing that's occurred in the last decade is we've actually seen an, ups, an upswing in private sector investment in what it takes to engineer a fusion reactor solution. And interestingly, the focus has been on small modular, small modular reactor packaging of these concepts, as opposed to looking at gigawatt plus plants, the size of ITER and whatnot, we're actually talking about units that would be generating something on the order of 100 megawatt electric. And, the, and among the recognized world leaders in that field, please Google it, is, is uh, General Fusion, a company located in Burnaby, British Columbia, who's been around for about 15 years. And it is actually moving now to what it's called its first prototype demonstration of its concept. 
And so I believe it's coming and it's coming and uh, I just can't predict how fast here, Art. What I find compelling though is because of this focus on the SMR solution, as it comes online, you can do a one-for-one -one replacement with conventional nuclear, or, well, I'm sorry, with, with, with fission SMRs. So, uh, but you have to still make it work economically. You have to deal with fuel issues because it still will use radioactive fuels and uh, because the, the general consensus that you have to use the deuterium tritium um, uh, fusion reaction is the most viable at least early days. So I do believe it's coming and we need to be investing in fusion. The problem is I don't think it's gonna get there at scale we need to get to where we need to get to by 2050. But all of that technology that we're looking at getting there by 2050 will need to be replaced to continue to be zero, net zero going into the future. I believe that fusion will come into the mix and play a significant role. Thank you. I, I had a comment, um, um, which I'll just throw in before I turn David loose. Um, the, um, uh, the question is, um, should we, um, have you considered all of the, um, the, the more dire climate change thoughts in the scheduling? I worry, frankly, that, you, that we don't have until 2070 of a stable, um, of a stable situation to build any kind of reactors. So um, uh, was, was um, a climate change schedule included in that schedule that you were writing down? So, so a couple comments. First off, the, I've shown you some uh, analysis out of the, and, and dug a little deeply into this from the International Energy Agency um, and its scenarios. I indicated to you the, the 2019 scenarios that I drew on showed a sustainable development scenario that got us to net zero by 2070. It's World Energy Outlook in 2020 published a new, what it's called, it's new net zero scenario, which gets us to net zero by 2050. And it's essentially more of the above, but faster. And it, it, my, my view here, uh, uh, Zach, is one needs to look at this absorb it and just realizing how daunting the task is. And uh, we need to start now. And, and what we need are solutions that work technically and solutions that are affordable. And frankly, solutions that don't uh, create other problems by solving one problem. We need variable renewables at massive scale. But we also need to make sure that the grid needs for electricity, which speak to reliability, can also be addressed. And this is where important synergies can occur between technologies like nuclear and variable renewables as we go forward. My concern is that too often our discussion gets locked in on a certain uh, view or a dogma that, um, well, because of nuclear safety, we've got to take it out of the mix. Uh, I, you know, frankly, I think Germany is a, is a fascinating case study on, on what can be happening if we take a nuclear out of the mix too quickly before we're ready to actually bring a, a, a re, um, variable renewables at scale into the mix. It's daunting. So I, I would say that the climate emergency is just that. What it needs is an on, uh, all decks on hand solution giving every technology the opportunity to contribute based on its strengths and to free up the potential to do so. And that requires investment from the private sector. It requires the right mix of public uh, policies and it needs uh, a broader societal engagement so society understands and, and is comfortable with the mix that is going forward led by policymakers. Uh, I, I guess I'm, I'm just saying that the ambition that we've got here, for example, in the SMR roadmap in Canada, could it go faster? Uh, yes, but it also needs investment to go there. And that's where, frankly, governments get stymied is that, in, you know, in the face of a pandemic, do we put the money into this as well as into the renewables that we need going forward? 
it's complex. I hope I didn't duck the question here, Art, but I, I or Zach, I think uh, I've tried to give you a pragmatic view of what's needed, uh, and I hope it's been seen as such. You didn't duck it at all. I, I'm, I'm very grateful. Thank you very much. Um, you said it's a major question. It's a hard one, which I guess I knew that. Um, listen, uh, Art, when, when does this uh, uh, session turn into a pumpkin? I've got a raft of questions here. Uh, many of them are from uh, one, one particular direction, but several of them are from other directions. When do we turn into a pumpkin? We, we can tell, go on as, as, as long as we wish, but I, uh, I suggest that we, we follow the order that they came. I think Jean was next. Okay, well, uh, Jean, uh, you're up with several, but before, be, interspersed with you, uh, there, there's Bill, Bill Pugsley, and I know it's not Jean. <laughs> you don't like my hair, do you? <laughs> Okay, so kind of a segue, it's Dave. Um, I think, Bob, that what I really just heard you say is that this is urgent. Also, as a result of the scale of the problem, which directly leads to my question, the first one, uh, it says to me that actually what we need is a national energy plan. You can call it whatever you like. If you think that the last time you tried to do that was disastrous, which it wasn't, um, we need somebody to plan and organize all of this. If we leave it to the private sector and a whole bunch of different competitors trying to get their pieces of the pie, it's going to turn into a disaster or, and it's maybe the same thing, it's going to turn into a monopoly. Uh, we're either never going to get there or we're going to get there at a cost that we can't afford, I would argue. But that leads to this which is how many plants do we need? How big do they need to be? When do we need them for Canada on the one hand, but for the world on the other? Because of course you realize that uh, places like Pakistan and are in the middle of trying to solve their energy crisis, which they believe is that we don't have enough and it's not affordable enough uh, by going to coal. Thanks, Dave. Uh... So that's that's a you know a, a, wow. So there's big questions. So let me just clarify. Uh, when I said private sector led versus uh, state led, that didn't mean that it's not public policy led. It needs to be public policy led. But what I was saying here, when it actually comes to the wherewithal to finance and roll out the build. The move to the SMR paradigm actually puts the that's that back in the space of the private sector to pursue the market opportunities that the policy basis has created, and that's enormously in, important change. It's not that the government has to be providing deep pocketed subsidization to the technology. No, it can stand on its own economics. It just needs the right policy environment to move forward. When we come back to the issue of, of choice, the reality is that all nations around the world, depending on their economic reality, are making choice as, choices as we speak that are both contributing to solving the problem and are compounding the problem. And whether that's a decision to exit nuclear power, as has occurred in, in, in Germany, or whether it's about uh, my growing economy needs more power today. When last I looked, China was adding a new coal-fired plant to its energy base every two weeks. And so we have to recognize the scale of the problem and the investment. If I come back and say, if you look at nuclear power, the goal would be to double the installed capacity over the next 30 years. In Canada, the, there have been studies to said that if, if you look at uh, going from uh, our energy demand today, first off, the problem in Canada is not about cleaning up electrification. We have a, a, a small number of provinces still burn coal, but it is a relatively minor problem in our energy mix. Our problem tends to be with energy consumed in transportation industry building heating. And the, the recommendation there is that we have to scale up the electrification in Canada 
by about a factor of between two and three. What is the scale of that? Enormous. Uh, I don't know if anybody online is from British Columbia, but you have the big uh, Site C dam that's trying to, hydro dam that's trying to move forward for approval. Imagine in the next 30 years building 200 of them. That's the scale of what's required. And so in case the recommendation is you would have to double or tri triple the installed uh, capacity in nuclear in Canada. The view is the way to do it is not by building gigawatt plants, it's by building uh, modular plants that can do a one for one replacement of, uh, of what we have in uh, natural gas and coal today and do it in conjunction with the rollout of solar and wind so you come back and solve that energy storage problem, I said. So, you know, you can, you can map this into the numbers. Uh, part of the dilemma we have here, Dave, is that it's the question of, is it a field of dream solution? Do I build it and they will come? A big reason you need to electrify is because you move to electric vehicles and your demand for electric vehicles pulls the need to invest in more electrification. Who starts first? You build the plant and wait for electrification or of, of, um, of uh, cars, or do you uh, look at electrification of cars and build, then build the plants? It's, it's perhaps we need to do both. To date, no provincial utility in Canada has actually forecasted a demand in electricity in their province. None, zero. Yet, all of the analysis says that we need to electrify home heating, and, uh, and uh, transportation to solve this problem. But, but if the utilities aren't building the capacity because they don't see the demand, you're in a circle and a vicious circle. So anyway, I, 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 perhaps I'm wandering in my comments here, but I hope I'm touching on some of the points you're making here. Um, thanks, uh, uh, um, uh, Bill, uh, Jean. Okay, um, um, listen, there, there's a few more from from uh, Dave and Jean, but um, I've also got from Ted and Bill Pugsley and from uh, John. So let's go to Ted and then Bill and then John and then come back to, to Dave, if you will accept that. Okay, so uh, Ted, um, would you go next? Oh, you're not muted. Ted Manning, are you there? Going once. Going twice. Bill Pugsley, are you there? I think so. <laughs> uh, first off, uh, thanks very much, Bob, for your talk. I was very interested in it. Um, and uh, I might say that uh, before I give you this question about uh, uranium resources worldwide, uh, at, at National Defense College, I did my thesis there, uh, and that was about 30 years ago on the need for, for nuclear submarines for the uh, Arctic, the Canadian Arctic, um, to maintain sovereignty over the threat of foreign, foreign countries looking at, after our resources up there. And this brought me into uh, the whole question of nuclear submarines, which uh, as, as a group, uh, the totals are around, I mean, the Americans have about half of the nuclear submarines in the world, was 72 according to unclassified sources and uh, they're not diminishing from that and so that in turn represents about a third of the number you quoted for uh, the world's uh, nuclear plants well a third of the nuclear plants are in boats under the water and so that means there's another asset another dimension to all this anyhow getting back to my question which was driven by uh, the reason I joined KCOR in the early 90s, which was because Rob Hoffman uh, had developed a world model, a global system simulator, which uh, he changed to ad adapt to the global uh, scale. And that allowed uh, people who were interested in what's happening globally with climate change and all that to do various experiments. So one experiment I did was to say, okay, if we replaced all the conventional electricity generated by conventional means, hydro, uh, fossil fuels, or whatever, with nuclear power, uh, what would it 
resolve in globally? And the answer was, in order to do that, um, you'd need 50 times as much uranium as uh, is, is used now. And we, the current or the, the then global supply was about 15 times more. So that told me right off the bat that nuclear power uh, would never be more than, uh, at, at best, 20% of the total. The, but the surprising other result was the simulator said that there would be so much uh, carbon dioxide or G, GHGs produced in creating these nuclear plants that it would overwhelm um, the CO2 uh, globally. Um, so this meant that if you did go down the, this route, and you seem to be hinting at that when you say going up by a factor of 10 at least, that the construction of the plants, the cement used and all the rest, would be a, a, a factor to consider uh, seriously. So the question is, um, to what extent is the world supply of uranium uh, a limiting factor for nuclear power on a much grander scale, as we are finding lithium is in developing batteries for electric vehicles. And as a PS to that, about a year ago, I was in Portugal and I found that uh, Portugal is the uh, leading country for lithium in Europe, which uh, in turn led the government to push electric vehicles all over the place, much more so than in Canada. So back to the question, how does the world supply of uranium affect uh, going grand scale nuclear power? Thanks, thanks here, Bill. It, you know, we probably need an offline discussion because it seems our background is probably intersected in a number of places. I was also at National Defense College and I was also involved in the team looking at uh, the selection of Canada's first nuclear submarine at the ill-fated defense policy of, when was it, 1980? 89. Yeah, I think uh, three three different governments have approved uh, a nuclear submarine fleet for okay. Canada. Yeah. And going to, back to be clear, Baker everybody. and then Mulroney. Yeah, well, to be clear, we were talking about nuclear propulsion, not n nuclear weapons. But uh, so, right, but right. The, the the point the, to your point, uh, the the concept of small modular reactors have been around for 50 years. It's, it's embedded in uh, military nuclear propulsion. These are small modular reactors. So it only points to the feasibility of the concept, if you like, that we're now performing, for, uh, proposing for a larger rollout in the, uh, in the uh, global energy industry. Uh, the issue around um, how much uranium is out there is a bit like the peak oil argument. It seems like, uh, that any time we've been viewing we're running out, we just do more exploration and we find more. Uh, the current estimates I've heard is that if we proceed at a pace somewhat uh, like we're on today, there's enough uranium for about 300 years. So you look at doubling it, which is what the capacity forecasted in the IEA reports would be, we'd bring that down to a, a shorter number. That said, we're now into the question of whether it's economical to recycle the, um, the used fuel, which only uses about one to 2% of the uranium energy content in that fuel and using it again in a number of these SMR concepts actually propose that. And then ultimately you get into the concept of fuel breeding using another uh, uh, have an element called thorium, which is in a very massive abundancy. And you can put the thorium in the reactor. It captures a neutron and transmutes into a fissionable version of uranium, which now can be the fuel source. So these designs are all possible. It costs a bit more to go into what's called breeding technology, breeder technology. But should you get to a point where uranium is scarcer and more expensive, those technologies become affordable. So I do not believe there is a shortage of, of um, uranium in the, in the scale of centuries. And maybe in that time frame, we're going to have uh, the fusion solutions that will ultimately solve it. I also think I might have misspoke here, but when it comes to the uh, use of, of structural materials in building the uh, power plants, 
uh, nuclear is actually by far the consumer of the least footprint of materials of all energy sources per unit energy produced and including the full life cycle of mining through to uh, uh, operation of nuclear plants. It is only just behind wind in terms of its GHG footprint and ahead of solar and renewable. So uh, again, just to uh, pull a bit deeper on some of the points you raised there. Hope that's helpful. That's good, thank you. Um, um, thank you. Uh, um, uh, it's Ted and then John, and it looks like it's uh, back to, to Dave again. Thanks, Zach. Uh, this threw me out for some reason, but I'm back in. I hope you can hear me. Bob, that was wonderful. I've played around the edges of some of the things you're doing. Um, we have a terrible PR problem just because of the name. I mean, uh, if we didn't use the word nuclear from the start, uh, we, we would not be essentially fighting Hiroshima all the way. I remember uh, fighting for Environment Canada to try and get rid of some low level radioactive waste from an old plant at, uh, at the airport at uh, Sea Island in British Columbia. And they would not even allow any community to take a truck through the community to take the stuff up to where it came from in the first place, putting it down a mine in the Okanagan. Uh, they were so afraid and yet the uh, actual level of radiation was less than a, than a box of wristwatches going to, going, going to Walmart. Uh, and they eventually ended up uh, with Greenpeace going all around it, putting it on a barge and towing it out beyond the, the 12 mile limit. And uh, Greenpeace was up and down claiming we were gonna poison all the whales. Uh, the, the, the issue really is, uh, you know, I think, I think the technical solutions are far less onerous than the human ones. And I, I was very pleased that you addressed that issue of, of trying to make it palatable. I have one uh, comment, location. Most of our urban, our nuclear plants now, in Canada at least, are in urban or semi-urban areas. Uh, and therefore the fear is being stoked every time somebody sees a, a truck that has a radioactive symbol on it go by. Uh, one of the solutions somebody had suggested was we go up to the source near Athabasca Lake, put them all there and use new fiber optic graphene technology to bring the, the electricity largely lossless, leave the stuff there. And even though technically it may not be essential, uh, psychologically or socially, that might actually work. Anyway, I'm just throwing an idea at the wall. What do you think? So, so thanks, Ted. I um, <laughs> look. Um, I, you know, I I'm I'm an engineer by training. Mm -hmm. I have come to have a deep and profound respect for the social sciences through my career. Mm -hmm. My earlier comments around uh, you know the science, mm -hmm. society, and policy. A relationship is driven by some of my work with social scientists and I believe if there's any industry that needs a whole lot more social science in it, it's the nuclear industry. Yeah. And I think as general, uh, the culture of engineers is we'll just talk a little louder and tell people the answer and the facts and mm -hmm. everything will sort itself out. But time has proven, time and our experience has proven time and again that there are just so many other factors at play that make that notion of it's just about the fact yeah. is not enough. And, and so I actually believe that this is a generational problem that needs to be tackled through our engagement with the new generation, not the generation my age and associated colleagues that associate with the anti-nuclear movement. This is a new discussion with a new generation around the new problems that we have left for them. And that is about, we've got to solve climate change. And if you come, we've got to find the answer. And if you come forward and say, I can give you an answer that enables solar and wind, that uses the least resources, that actually does it at an affordable price uh, and looks at the benefits, then whether you've branded it nuclear or not, you're going to move forward. I also would just come back and pick, pick your point that you've got, there's some truth in what you're saying, because if you go back 30 years ago, 
when the technology was first rolled out, there was this great breakthrough medical technology called nuclear magnetic resonance, MNR, NMR. And very early on, it was recognized, this isn't going to work. Let's call it MRIs. Mm -hmm. Get the word <laughs> nuclear out. But what is it at its heart? It's a nuclear technology. And so, uh, but to the point yeah. is that I believe, and frankly, polling suggests this. It, certainly, if you go out and if repeatedly you bring together young Canadians in a discussion around how do we solve climate change, Mm -hmm. And then you bring in a discussion of nuclear's role, and let's talk about ionizing radiation, let's talk about safety, let's talk about waste, but also let's talk about GHD footprint, how it yeah. enables renewables, the air pollution, all of those perspectives. Generally, you have people nodding up and down, let's make this work. And I believe it's that kind of recasting of the problem with uh, a new generation of Canadians that perhaps aren't wedded to uh, their current uh, uh, views is needed. And frankly, that, that's, there's a number of, of people in the industry, the nuclear industry, that need to change their mindsets as well. Uh, fast follow-up question. How come France manages to get almost, what, two-thirds of their power from nuclear? How did they get away with it? So, in, in another time. I tell you right now that uh, uh, France is actually in a very, very precarious place with nuclear yeah. energy. Uh, mm -hmm. Right now, uh, some polling numbers, I won't have this precise, but I think I'm close to the numbers, that in the age cohort from about 19 to 30 in France, in that age co cohort, 70% of those, uh, of those uh, individuals believe that nuclear energy in their country actually contributes to climate change. Oh dear. Oh, oh, <laughs> Good I, luck. <laughs> it is a major issue in that in that country as it is elsewhere. So just the fact yeah. you have nuclear at home doesn't mean your population is with you. We really do need to engage in more effective ways to tell the story. Thanks very much. Oyve, John, you're up. Thank you, Zach, uh, and thank you, Bob Walker. That I really thoroughly enjoyed that, partly because my first six months in Canada, I was a guest in the laboratories of ACL at um, at, at Chalk River, uh, and in that time, I met John Hilborn and Peter Stevens Gill, who built Slowpoke. I think it was a twenty kilowatt self regulating reactor, and there are one or two of those still around, but they didn't really go anywhere. Uh, let, me, let me make an observation. Um, on the roads in Canada re in recent years, we kill roughly 2,000 people. So we say six a day. Now, if there was a plane crash that killed six people, it would be front page news for a couple of days. So uh, the, the ability of our society to balance risks is rather modest. Now, let me tie that, in a sense, you've already answered my, my question in your response to Ted. Um, our parliamentary democracy has changed quite substantially uh, in the last three quarters of a century from when the decisions were made to establish ACL and, and go with uh, build a can do. Um, in those days, uh, the parliamentarians, the ministers, the governments were wide open to uh, professional advice on all subjects and, and they were willing to look out for long periods of time. In the last two decades, perhaps three, parliamentary democracy in Canada has become a one-man band. F permanent electoral mode in, in our parliament and, and no s clear sense of, of, the, of the obligation to future uh, generations. Now, uh, the, the, the point I'd like you to just touch on is, what can, and you've come to the right place in a way. KCOR has uh, pe members with academic backgrounds that run from anthropology right through to the social sciences. We haven't yet re recruited a, a, a zoologist, but we're working on it. Um, and um, uh, we, I don't think KCOR is a modest 
think tank is capable of doing much in the way of communication, but where do you see the onus? Who could communicate and establish the national mood that would open the door to what you're talking about? Well, John, that's a, a pretty profound question. I, I, I guess to, you know, let me just come at this a couple of ways. First off, uh, what we have seen in Canadian politics over the last decade or so is a 3P problem. We have seen increasing politicization, polarization, and partisanship that goes around literally every major or grand challenge facing this country. And, uh, and with that, I think the uh, challenges of building national consensus on systemic solutions to those systemic problems is fleeting. And let me just make the observation that a systemic solution to a systemic problem is not one that can be voted out at the next election. And the answer to climate change it, at a policy level is actually about needing coherent energy, environment, economic, and social policy that survives at least six cycles of provincial and federal government elections. That's what we need. It needs a state, and a number of you have, have raised this question about where's the plan? Uh, well, the government puts forward a plan, a new provincial uh, uh, party comes in and, and says, I don't agree, go in a different direction. And federal parties align with platforms that are diametrically opposed. And every time you come to election, you have a risk of tearing up the plan and starting it again. And in fact, interestingly, I come back to the world of social scientists. Social scientists polling of the attitude of the average Canadian to climate change and the, space of, of, of the pace of transition shows that there's a greater alignment of what needs to be done than the polarization we see in political parties federally and provincially. And so this whole notion, you see it in spades in the US, of course, this whole moving of political positioning to the extremes, the hard left, the hard right, are actually uh, uh, being uh, uh, counter to actually providing long-term viable solutions to the big problems facing this country. I also believe that among the spaces where we can make a difference is actually by recasting the role of the uh, academia in this space. I believe that academia can play a role of convening national discussions around some of these big problems, including starting with the student populations, which by the way will be uh, a large percentage of the leaders in Canada society going forward around just what these problems are and solutions that can work for everybody and let the politicians get up, get up and follow the crowd as opposed to trying to lead it with polarizing views that don't work for anybody. Sorry if I got a little passionate on that view, but I, I, I think uh, we just need to recast this problem with one that politicians need to be out there to help us, not hurt us. That would be nice. Uh, Dave, Gene, whichever of you, you're up next. Yeah, so yeah. I, I really like this comment about being able to go through a time period that's much more than a few election cycles. Seven generations arguably would be appropriate, <laughs> but we recently had uh, an approximately 30 year contract that got signed with the government of China. And I don't see why we couldn't have a 30 year contract that would be signed between all the governments of Canada that we could have, as I described earlier, a national plan to manage our energy supply and an organization to do it. I think that's absolutely brilliant. Make it a contract and make it so that any new government that replaces another can't get out of the contract. Simple, that's what was done by the previous federal government. It leads though to my question and it's directly related to all the comments that we've just heard because my, my next question is about uh, whether we can get support largely from the public but also from potentially affected communities to have such reactors in various places around the country and whether we couldn't do it by actually offering them compensation 
this actually has been done in a number of places in Europe where people, you know, companies have come into some farmer's yard and they said, I want to put up a big uh, uh, wind turbine in your backyard and we're going to pay you a dividend of 500 pounds a month or 500 euros a month or whatever it might be. And the, the farmer looked at them and said, well, of course, can you start tomorrow? You know, why don't we just offer these people compensation? It could be in the form of ownership, could be in the form of dividends, whatever it might need to be, but that can't be organized by anybody but some kind of a central command structure. So what do you think? How much do we need? To whom? How do we do it? So, um, yeah, so A, A, this is complex. Uh, B, there have been successes in the past we could leverage. Uh, a few observations I, I might make here. For, first off, um, the sing let me just pull a few threads. The single largest um, challenge to, on, on, to uh, um, unlocking the uh, rich mineral resources in Canada's north that become more accessible as climate change goes forward is what? It's energy. It is the single factor that makes resort mining in the north with these new markets viable is energy. It's even worse than that because when you're not near a grid, which a sizable number of these uh, mines are not near, it's how do you get that energy? And the only viable solution today is diesel. It, the latitude and the environment doesn't make wind or solar the solution. Maybe help a bit, but not the solution. And so you've got a bunch of these global mining companies deep pocketed that said, you give me an energy solution that will work, I'll buy it. It's just I don't want to be the first one out there. So prove to me you can do it. And so that gets into the whole focus on demonstration. When you get into indigenous and northern communities, the core question is who pays for their electricity today? Who pays for it? Which by the way is there's 300 communities in Canada that are dependent on diesel power for their energy. The vast majority of these are indigenous uh, and most of them are north. Who pays for that electricity today? The federal government federal government pays. It's a subsidy. So the, the point is that the federal government is already in its fiscal framework paying for their energy. You're going in and saying, I'm going to give you a better solution. It may not cost the federal government anymore, but actually you give them a more reliable solution, more energy, and with that more economic opportunity, food security, water security, you help those communities move forward in so many ways you solve so many of the other problems that underpin reconciliation challenges in this country. And the discussions with a number of those First Nations say, aha, we're interested and we want to look at this as a business deal, my comment around the business model, and we're prepared to not only house it, we're prepared to invest in it and own equity. And so the opportunities exist and it can be happen. To the larger question of the effect, the federal, uh, the federation in Canada and the federal provincial authorities, we are into a very great morass here, as you know, Dave. I mean, energy supply is the provincial authority. Energy regulation is a federal authority, at least when it comes to safety. And how do you square the circles in that? Uh, you know, you've seen the challenges around carbon taxation. Uh, we've just got to move beyond the bun fights between federal and provincial governments and, and, and the notion of political futures and trying to uh, uh, get reelected to what's in the national interest and ways to move that forward. We need those mature discussions. I'm just not convinced they're going to occur in the House of Parliament. I love that. What a way to end that. <laughs> Listen. We, 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 I don't know how long, how much longer we can go on, but this was so much fun, Bob. Thanks so much. I really, I'm really glad you came in, and I'm really glad to have heard all of this stuff. And thanks everybody else for talking and asking all the questions. And Art, I don't know what you want to do now. Do you want to Parliament keep going in tomorrow, or?